1 Thessalonians 5, beginning at verse 1. Now, the context right before this has been the secret coming of Jesus Christ for the Christians and to catch them out and take them home. And, of course, when we talk about the second coming of Christ, that's mainly what we're talking about. We're not talking about a big old final judgment. People have a funny idea. We talk about the second coming of Christ. These nuts think we're talking about the heavens and earth melting with a fervent heat and the whole works just blowing kablooey and everything going to smithereens and the judgment taking place. We're not referring to that. We talk about the second coming of Christ. We're talking about in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the Lord descending from heaven with a shout, the voice of the king, the trump of God, and the saved people leaving. See, we're not talking about the other. Like a preacher up one time was talking about the white throne judgment, and he's talking about the heavens and earth and the blast of the archangels, trumpet and the smoldering universe and the conflagration of the stars as the heavens and earth melted in fervent heat. And, you know, he's really going there pretty good. And the little old boy turned to his mom and he said, uh, Mama, will I get out of school? <laughs> yeah, you'll get out of school, honey. <laughs> but that's the last day, see, and we're not talking about the last day. We're talking about the Lord coming for his own. All right, five, one. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves, know perfectly. We have perfect knowledge. I'm sorry I didn't believe he could have that, but he wasn't too bright anyway. For yourselves, know perfectly. We have absolute truth. He didn't, that's his problem. For yourselves, know perfectly. Let us say, yeah, absolute truth makes you bigot, you know. Well, then God's the biggest bigot that ever lived. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You know when it's coming. Unsaved world doesn't know when it's coming. You know when it's coming. You know the times and seasons perfectly. Now, you may not know the day. You may not know the hour, but you know the time and the season. Verse 3, as travail upon a woman with child. Is there a man in this building that doesn't know when his son or daughter is going to be born as far as the time and the season go? You know the Bible is an awful crude book, isn't it? You better get something kind of uh, veneered and embellished and varnished and fixed up like Satanism or dope addiction commonly called. You ever notice how these people profess to tell the truth, the most plainy, uh, the plainest, are the biggest hypocrites in the world when it comes to talking clear? You ever notice that? The fellow says, in the drug culture, you mean the dope heads? Is that what you're trying to say? Somebody said, well, in this ethnic culture, you mean Buddhism, black magic, and witchcraft? That's what you're trying to say? It, it's always been strange to me that I'll uh, get on the message in a minute, but it's always been strange to me how these folks that keep saying, tell it like it is, talk plain, can't talk plain. Now, uh, those of us who believe this book, we're plain talkers. We'll talk plain with you. We'll put it over the plate, waste time where you can get it. Is there a man or woman of this village doesn't know when the baby's coming as far as the time and the season are concerned? No. Now, the doctor doesn't know the day. He doesn't know the hour. You don't know the day and hour. You know the time and the season. Now, wouldn't you be a fool to say you didn't know the time and the season? Come on now. The Bible says the day of the Lord comes like that. You know the time and the season. You know it perfectly. All this stuff about nobody can know. We know something. We know it perfectly. And we know it as well as we know when our children are coming. We don't know the day or the hour, but we know the time and the season. All right, fine. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. Father, bless the reading of the word. May the Holy Spirit edify us, make these words clear to us, the meaning of this passage clear to us. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now, I call your attention to some words here. Verse 2, in the night. In the night. Verse 5, of the night. Verse 7, in the night. Verse 7, in the night. 
The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is like in the night time. When the Bible speaks of Christ coming, the Bible speaks of a night watch. The Lord Jesus Christ said, If the good man had known what watch of the night the thief would have come, he would not have suffered the house to be broken into. Watch be ye therefore, you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Lest he come in the evening, night, midnight, night, cock crowing, night, or in the morning. What I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Now, whatever the second coming of Jesus Christ is like, there's one thing for sure, it's like in the night time. Night time. And if you can study and learn about conditions at night, you know about the conditions that precede the second coming of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to talk a while today about night time. And I'm going to say something important, and I hope you're awake, and you're going to hear, and you're going to listen. They have a story about a man, this isn't true, but I mean, it illustrates the point. They have a story about a man that got a parakeet, and they said that parakeet could talk, and that fellow tried for five years to get that parakeet to say something. And he brought in books on how to talk and played him records on how to talk and brought in other pain trained parakeets to show him how to talk. And he got all those parakeets in the house talking and tried to get his parakeet to talk and the parakeet would never say anything. And finally he gave up and after about four and a half years he took that cotton picking bird and put him in a cage and took him back to the pet shop. And on the way to the pet shop that went by a dangerous intersection the parakeet said, Look out! And he just slammed head on in the car and went off to court. And when those two cars collided, that parakeet in that cage said, Isn't that something? He tried for five years to get me to say something, and the first time I say something important, he doesn't listen. Now, you know that never happened. You know that never happened. But you know, I'm going to say something important. And if it's nighttime, number one, everybody's going to be sleeping. You know, there are very few people awake at 3 o'clock in the morning, and those on shift work are about to drop, and those who work that old shift, you know, from 12 to 6, you know, that old dead man shift, they about had it. That graveyard shift goes 12, 1, 2, 3. I am talking to a congregation that's about half asleep, and this congregation is one of the most alert congregations in this town. And if you're half asleep, can you imagine the condition the rest of them are in? I mean, just imagine the condition the rest of them are in if you're half asleep. <laughs> Can you imagine? That's published by the largest group of Baptists in the world. You know, some when it gets nighttime, everybody's sleepy. And nobody likes to be waking out of a sound sleep. Uh, you know, you get sleepy around 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, but most people can make it to 12 and 1 and some 2. But boy, when it gets about 3.30... Four, four thirty, quarter of five, you've been up all night, you're tired. And I have never met anybody in my life that's been up all night that's sleeping, working night shift, and you come by and knock at their door and it says, Do not disturb. I never met anybody appreciates you coming in and making a personal call and visitation. When I come by there and they come and I hear that air conditioner there and see all those shades down, and somebody comes to the door and says they worked midnight shift last night, I say, Okay, 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 be back later, be back later. Sometimes they get them up. I never let them do if I can help it. Get away. Let them sleep, man. Let them sleep. People don't appreciate being woken up, waking up, or woken up, awakened, or whatever, how you say it. They don't appreciate somebody coming by and kicking them out of a sound sleep. And I don't blame some of you Christians for getting mad at my preaching. I don't blame some of these folks in this town for getting very upset and very put out with me. I think they have their rights. They're in their rights and more power to them. Because I don't find anybody that's been asleep for four hours that appreciates somebody coming by and saying, Get up! Get up! Get up! Get up! Get up! Get up! They don't appreciate it. Don't appreciate it a bit. I don't think I would either. And you know something? At night time before the Lord comes, God's people are going to be asleep. Let's just face it. Some of you folks I'm talking to right now have never made a fool out of yourself for Christ's sake. Today you've got to say I'll tell you something else. Some of you that are that way have the biggest blabbering mouth about folks that try to do for something for God as anybody ever lived. You know what you are? You're just a four flushing blabber mouth is all you are. And I'll tell you something, you've been asleep ever since you've been saved and you're still asleep. You're not about to get up unless somebody kicks you. And God's going to have to throw some kickers to get you out of bed. You just fancy you're living for the Lord. You're just having nightmares. That's your problem. Folks get sleepy. Did you know in the average church today they're just sitting and sitting and listening just about half asleep? 
I sometimes think air conditioners are a curse. I mean, I've been to some churches where you're so hot and sweating, you couldn't go to sleep. But you get one of these places, these soft seats, and they get that thing going, you know, and that soft breeze. Listen, just a minute, listen. Hear that thing? Isn't that beautiful? I mean, you know, if you came here nervous and upset this morning, it'd take more than me to get you awake, get you nervous and upset. Just say, hear that thing going, and boy, you ought to see some of the churches downtown. Man, when they get in there, the lights dim, you know, and the stained glass windows fill to the light so it doesn't come in too hard, and the carpet kind of diffuses the light in the right direction, and the preacher doesn't talk like I'm preaching. He gets up there and says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. And they're silent. They're asleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let all the earth keep silence before him. <laughs> Cross there. Did you know most Christians over 40 years old have just quit trying to do anything for God? Most of them over 40. I guess a lot of them under 30. Just quit trying. You know why? The tired. The tired. They're just wore out. All right, the next thing about nighttime. In nighttime, buildings are empty. Everybody's at home. It's getting harder and harder to get a crowd out at night. Why, our theaters in Pensacola are showing movies that couldn't have passed the censor in 1930. They're showing them and advertising them as family entertainment. You know why? They're trying to get people away from the homes and get them in the building. I mean, the sun goes down, you see these cars begin to move. You know where they're going? They're going home. 3.30, 4.35, that traffic is just going like that. They're going home. They're not going to the buildings. You go downtown at night around, around 8 or 9 o'clock, fill up a little old line of people standing outside a theater, one or two people coming out of a drinking place. The rest of those stores are closed down there. They're closed. Even if they, they get wilder and wilder. Over here at Cordova Mall and some of these malls, they're trying to get bigger and bigger and richer and richer and fancier and fancier or more fanciful and just keep get that thing getting bigger and bigger and bigger to get you to leave your home and come out there. You know something? The time has come in America when you can't put up a cement block building and get a Christian to leave his boob tube at night to come out there and worship God. The building's empty. That's why they empty all across this land Sunday night. The people are at home. And that's why the churches are empty. And as the Lord tallies and nighttime goes on, the church buildings are going to get more empty by the minute. Today, to get a big crowd in church, they're having to build theaters. I could take you in churches across this country that put Grumman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood out of business when it came to tapestry and architecture and money spent. You know why they do that? You have to do that to get them to leave their house at night and come out there. I mean, who's going to leave that big old color entertainment center sitting there where they can see all the kings of this world in a glory in a moment of a time and come out to a cement block building with plain windows and light bulbs in it, ordinary light bulbs. At night time, the buildings are empty. The family circle has become the TV semicircle, as a man says. And if you want to see where the hearts of God's people are, you come to prayer meeting and visitation. You'll find out. Prayer meeting, visitation, the church shows where the heart members' churches are, the church members' hearts are, and the hearts are on inactivity, doing nothing, and security. The hearts are on fishing, and hunting, and golf, and football, and baseball, and Miss America contests, and price of living, and newscasts. We have members in our church, and I'm safe to say it over the radio, might as well be honest about it. We have members in our church that haven't been out here one night in visitation in eight years. And I'll tell you something else. You're not going to be out in the next eight years either. I remember we had a family here one time in our church that lived a block and a half from the church. A block and a half from the church. They didn't make one prayer meeting in six years. A block and a half from the church. Come to think of it, they met two of them when there was a business meeting going on. <laughs> Shows where the heart is. And as night wears on, the buildings are empty, so when the buildings get empty and folks are at home, the church building's going to be empty, and the folks are at home. And don't put on the shoe if it doesn't fit. I know some of you folks live 20 miles from here. Don't get upset. I know some of you folks work two jobs at a time, double shift, time and a half overtime. Well, I know how it goes. I mean, some of you, it's impossible. But, brother, if it's possible, you're sure going to give a count today of judgment. All right, number three, at night time, robbers and adulterers are busy. You may find some folks stealing in broad daylight or committing adultery in broad daylight, 
But most of the folks that wait for the devilment wait till the sun goes down and the lights go out. And I've always been suspicious of houses where I come up to the visitation and there isn't a light on in the house but kind of a blue light sifting out under one of the blinds. You ever see that? I mean, honest to goodness, man, I have been in hell holes in New Orleans had the same atmosphere in some of the homes doing Pensacola. I've come to some homes in Pensacola, $35,000, $40,000 homes, and walked up there and knocked at the door, and there's this blue light here. It kind of flickers, you know. And the door opens, and the door opens, you just, there's just a scream that hits your face. I tell you, it's like, it's like walking into a seance, and all this stuff just comes whoosh out the door and hits you. They wait for darkness. The Bible says they love darkness rather than light because of these were evil. And that reminds me to say, if the second coming of Jesus Christ is like nighttime, then there's going to be people out to steal your faith before Christ comes back. And spiritual adulterers are going to be busy plying their trade. They're going to adulterate that Word of God. They're going to thin it down. They're going to soup it over. They're going to warm it out. They're going to adulterate it. A translation you can believe in, the New American Standard Bible. You better have not believe it. Takes out the ascension of Christ in Luke chapter 24, denies the virgin birth of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 2, denies the deity of Christ in 1 Timothy chapter 3. You better hadn't believe in it. You know what it says? Dr. Mark Moore says, quote, it stands comfortably. <laughs> What's that, doctor? <laughs> it stands comfortably, comfortably, comfortable. When was Christianity supposed to be comfortable? Anything comfortable when you folks stand up and sing, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame? It stands comfortably. It does. Remind me to get rid of it. It stands comfortably between the well-loved King James Bible and the RSV. <laughs> I believe that. I believe that. I believe that's right where it stands. Dr. Duke McCall, President of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, quote, a valuable new tool for the Bible student whose conviction for the inspiration of the Scripture produces concern for a precise translation of the Greek text. There is no such thing as the Greek text. And the next time you see Dr. Duke McCall, tell him I said so, and so on, please, and I'll see him in court 10 o'clock in the morning. Dr. George Sweeney, President Moody Bible Institute, quote, I appreciate its beauty and clarity as well as this faithfulness to the original text. And Dr. Sweeting knew he didn't have any original text when he said that, and he knew there wasn't any original text when he said that, and he said that, and just said that with a big smile on his sweet face, in the footsteps of Dwight L. Moody. And I'll tell you, brother, when the sun goes down, the adulterers come out and try to mix it and leaven it. That is no robbers get this. Did you know many of these religious organizations are just like protective associations? Did you ever work with a protective association? Do you know what a protective association is? I'll tell you what a protective association is. In a protective association, you go down to the candy store, and you say to the man who owns the candy store, we boys uh, have a little game up the street, you know, baseball and things, and sometimes it gets kind of wild, you know, and a ball gets hit over the fence, you know, or over the bush, and I'll break a window or something, and we don't want to bother anybody. We don't hurt anybody. We don't want trouble. And tell you what we'll do. If you'll give us uh, 25 cents a week, we'll make sure the ball don't come over here. You ever get one of those? After you grow up, you play it different. After you grow up, you go downtown to the jewelry store and say, uh, you got any insurance? Because you yeah, I got insurance. Well, who do you pay it to? Oh, so-and-so. Well, they can't protect you from break-ins, can they? I mean, just oh, somebody just went in the rampage around here, broke out your windows in broad daylight, and stole a bunch of stuff. Uh, you got protection about that kind of thing? Or you carry with so-and-so. Well, we think you better carry with us. And we'll, we'll see if it doesn't happen. Matter of fact, we'll station a man here about every other week and make sure it doesn't happen. And then if you don't pay, it happens. You know what we've got in America today? We have religious robbers. And they go up and down, they say to the preacher, you want a place to preach? You want a good congregation? You want a pension when you retire? Well, we'll protect you. You pay, you do. And if you don't pay, you do. Why, anything liable to happen. 
Amen? Amen. You bet your boots, amen. You know what you know? You know when those things happen, it's getting near the second coming of Jesus Christ because the robbers work at night. You know, all over this country there are spiritual robbers standing in pulpits robbing people of every dime they have. I mean, literally. Literally. I'm not talking about preachers preaching for money. I'm talking about standing up there and getting a guy's pension and getting him to cash his insurance policy in to get in the healing line. You know, somebody told me in this town, they said the last time one of these birds came through, he said the people down there cashing their government checks, cashing their weekly checks, cashing in their insurance and everything else to go down there and dump that thing for what? A thief. A thief. A thief. But he's going to give you faith. He's going to seal your faith. And he said to me one time, she said, the next door neighbor of mine went down there and she had a hand all like this and she said she got saved. And she said, but butter up in her hand is still just like that. She had more sense than some of you folks. I hear him getting on there. You know, some of these fellows are really in rough shape. Back when I first got saved, they really made an attempt at it. When I, when right after I got saved, they'd make you stand in the line. When I, when right after I got saved, they'd make you stand in the line. They'd come up there and they'd put the hand on you. And they'd pray, then they'd hit you in the head or punch you in the stomach or break your back or something, you know, give you a chiropractic treatment. And sometimes they had a metal plate down with a foot and put about 110 through, you know, just to... I mean, you really felt something, man. You got a point of contact. And I think that shock therapy heals some folks. I believe that. But you know, nowadays, they don't even fool with that anymore. Nowadays, those fellows, such poor professionals and poor actors and poor dramatists and poor speakers, they do all the stuff indirectly. You ever heard one of these programs? Fellow says, now here's a little lady, tell us what the Lord did for you. And she tells what the Lord did for her, and then she happened to get a prayer cloth or a piece of magazine or a rug from the Holy Land or some fool thing or a piece of wood off a dogwood tree at Santa Claus Prime when he slid down the chimney. And she brings up that thing and she says, and the Lord did this to me. Everybody says, how are you going to go out of there? Put your money in the plate. Well, it's, get, it's getting disgusting. I hear a fellow on the radio every Sunday morning comes on there and says, Mr. So-and-so from Fairbanks, Alaska, said, I have trouble, and you prayed for me. How many others prayed for you, lady? And you prayed for, did your pastor pray for you before you turned on the radio? And you prayed for me. How about the folks up in the hospital? Sorry, the three months you're up there. They do any praying for you? And you prayed for me, and I'm healed. Well, maybe you got healed in spite of the prayer. You know what you got all across this country? You got spiritual adulterers and the spiritual thieves, what you got. All right, listen. At night time, all the lights are artificial. I mean, all the lights are like these at night time. When the sun goes down, the artificial light comes up. Up comes the moon, reflects the light of the sun. On go the car lights, on go the headlights, on go the neon signs. And at night time, the lights are artificial. And I'll tell you, you better look out when a man stands up in the pulpit and talks to you about the light of the world. You better find out what light it is. Jesus Christ said, I am the light of the world. Now listen. If a man's going to point you the way home, he's got to have the real light, and the real light is Jesus Christ. And you look out for any man that points you to a church organization before he points you to Christ. And you look out for any man that points you to a sacrament before he points you to Jesus Christ. And you look out for any man that points you to a drug or a program or an institution or a catechism before he points you to Jesus Christ. I heard a whole this preach on the radio, March 16th, 1969, 9 o'clock in the morning, Sunday morning. Say, you ought to come and take the holy sacraments with us. You never got that in the Bible. The only Bible that's found is found in is the footnote of a new school for your reference Bible. And I'll tell you something else. There's no holiness preacher on the face of this earth since John the Baptist put the first one under the water that ever called the Lord's Supper a holy sacrament. You got that from someplace else. You got that from somebody holding up a flashlight. Instead of the light of this world, it's battery operated. It's not the real thing. You better look out for the false light. For example, in this great missionary magazine here, there are 47 pages devoted to occultism, Ouija boards, crystal balls, and this and that, and there isn't one page of criticism in the whole operation. She asked for prayer because she realized she was demonized. We discovered it was a result of practice with a Ouija board. Are you the Apostle Peter? Helen asked the Spirit before. Silence. Is it Jesus Christ, I ask? Who's asking an ordained, fundamental, premillennial, Bible-believing, orthodox minister? There he is right there. Well, I said premillennial. I probably said too much. He went to the church's school. He's amillennial. But he's fundamental. He believes the New American Standard Bible. He's got a copy and reads it and believes it and quotes the Scripture on it. There you go. 
How is that for mission? You never saw a better missionary set up than that, did you? Oh, if you want your money to get the mission, be sure and give to that outfit there. You know what those are? Those are artificial lights not pointing the way. Somebody comes around your house, knocks the door, you let them in. They bring in a little old thing, a uh, bunch of records, sit down and say, may we play you some records, you know? And you say, well, who are you? Oh, we're Bible students. We're Bible students. And they point you to a translation, and they point you to a tower instead of pointing you to Jesus Christ. And somebody comes around your house, they're always riding bicycles, have little hats on, your little bicycle hat. They come pet around your house and stop there and they get out and they try to point you to a church and point you to an apostle and appoint you to an elder and appoint, and point you to golden plates. You better get somebody that can show you the light. You know, the Beatles had a song one time I really appreciate. I think it described their religion better than I, I know of. They had a song called The Nowhere Man. <laughs> I said, don't adopt that for a theme song. None of them ever been anywhere. The nowhere man. And all that business was people point artificial lights. If they don't point to the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, they're not giving you the right light. Here's a nice thing here. Here's a clipping from Elijah Muhammad Ali's paper, Muhammad Speaks, June 23, 1923. The most grave mistake, quote, that the... I can't read that over the air because we don't have freedom of speech in America anymore, is making today is trying to hold on to the belief in the return of Jesus or that he lived and preached the saving of the, and I can't quote that because you don't have freedom of speech, a world. <laughs> now, I'd like to quote that, but we're getting this broadcast, so you can't quote those two things there. One of them is talking about one kind of man, and the other's talking about another kind of man. One of them is talking about this kind of man, they're talking about this kind of man. <laughs> See? <laughs> But you can't say that over the radio, so I'll just say, he just says the, the, the greatest mistake that the, this kind of a man is making today is holding on to the belief in the return of Jesus or that he lived and preached the saving of the, the other kind of a man's world, see? That's all you can say. Now, you know what that fellow there says? He says the worst mistake you could make would be to believe in the return of Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you, brethren, that's the only hope you've got. Now, you may have a temporary hope of a new job or retirement. You may have a temporary hope of a marriage that'll work out. You may have a temporary hope of the devil not getting your kids. You may have a temporary hope of a new car next year or retirement or Social Security. You may have a temporary hope of not getting diabetes till next year, but the only permanent hope you have is for Jesus Christ to come back. And you with that, why aren't you doing something? All right, at night time, nobody can see very far. You know, I feel sorry for this generation coming up. They're worse shape than mine was, and mine was pretty rough shape. One of my boys said, well, you're just trying to say that the men were better back there because it was your generation. Yeah, that's what I am saying. They said, what about your daddy's generation? They were better. <laughs> what about your granddad's generation? They're better than any of us. I mean, I was talking to one of my boys one time, you know, about baseball. They're telling me, all, you know, you they don't have hitters, you know. You've got, back there you didn't have any hitters. Back there they couldn't play ball, you know. Back there, you know. You know, back there in Harbaugh, they had a knuckleball and a spitball and a beanball. Did you know that? And I'll tell you something else. You couldn't wear a helmet. Now, would some of you brave souls, some of you brave boys trying to beat Babe Ruth record, like to stand up against a knuckleball and a spitball without a helmet on? I'd like to see you try it. You don't have the nerve. Uh, so we talked about football one time. They said, oh, the fellas weren't as big then. You know. They weren't as tough then. Oh, yes, they were. You said, well, they didn't have the speed. What makes you think that people got them faster running, you know, just because they go to college? Well, that junk on. You know, back, back when I was a boy, the football heroes, they wore a leather helmet. A leather helmet. And they only had padding in a couple of places. They didn't have it all over. Just a couple of places. And a leather helmet. Can you imagine Deacon Jones hitting you in the head with a leather helmet? <laughs> you know, each generation has a little less to go by. And you never live in a generation of so, so short-sighted as this generation. Now, I'm what they call far-sighted. That is, uh, right here, I can't see nothing. I just see kind of a gray mass. I can tell the two columns of that Bible and a chapter and the name of a book up there, and that's about it. But you, if you get me out there in a boat, and I've got to look uh, eight, ten miles off and pick up a telephone pole on the shore, or a place there where an airplane hangar is sticking out behind a bunch of bushes, I can pick it up. And you know, back in the old days, Nearly all folks were far-sighted because they could see ahead a few days. You're living in a generation when nobody can prophesy 
24 hours ahead of time apart from that book. So no way they can do it. For example, when my dad was a little boy, they thought like this. They said, well, I'm going to go away to school. I'm going to get me an education. Everybody wanted education. And then they said, I'm going to decide what I want to be and study for. And then they said, I'm going to marry me a good girl and get out and start a home. For example, my father said, I'm going to be a military man. Well, he said, I'm going to go to school and try to take West Point exam. If I can pass the West Point exam, I'll go to West Point. When I get my commission, I move an army post and then think about seriously about getting married and have a family. Then I'm going to do this, this, and this, and work up captain, you know, major, lieutenant, colonel, colonel, full chicken on up. Did you know something? You can't do that anymore. Did you know you can't do that anymore? Back in the old days, a fellow said, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to work here in the city till I get enough, enough money to buy me 40 acres of ground out there, and then I'm going to marry my childhood sweetheart, and we're going to move out there and raise a family. You can't do that anymore. The government's got your land before you buy it for one thing, and they'll loan you money through the banks, and they run the banks for another thing, and for another thing, when you get on the land, they're going to tell you what you can grow and what you can't grow. You better find out what's the most profitable thing not to grow before you tell them what you're not going to grow. I mean, they might give you more money for not growing this than not growing this. So you've got to know what's going on these days. And, you know, talk about the Army. How are you fellas going to train to make a career out of the Army? You realize the Army you get into when you go by and salute some people, they can give you that and you can't even turn them in? You know what that is right there? Tell us about the power salute. That is the salute of the Communist Party in New York in 1930, 31, and 32. And I've got photographs of them giving that salute with a Cossack hat on and boots. Don't tell me where it's from. Imagine going by a fellow giving this and have the fellow giving you that. Let's just go by and give him that. <laughs> you just bought it much out of it. <laughs> you, can't, you can't see far ahead anymore. You know, uh, Christians back in the old days, they lived in the light of eternity. They were far-sighted. They were far-sighted. They're all short-sighted now. I mean, you Christians I'm talking to, now, right now, let me ask you this. What have you done this week that only a Christian would do? Come on now. What have you done this week that only a Christian would do? Hmm. The fellow said, I prayed, unsaved people pray. You said, I've treated folks right. I know unsafe people in this town that treat folks a lot better than some of you ever treated. You know what the trouble is? It's short-sighted. You live in that thing just for the week's paycheck and get the bills paid and go to the next day, and you need glasses. What have you done this week that only a child of God would do and nobody else would do? Short-sighted. You can't see very far. If you could see at the judgment seat of Christ, you'd get doing it, wouldn't you? Nighttime. I get ashamed of myself every time I miss a street meeting. I missed that one yesterday, and I just had too much work to do. I just worked on through it. But I wish I could have been there. I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I mean, only a born-again, saved child of God think of standing out there and telling people Jesus Christ saves, and you must be born again. You're going to hell if you don't get saved. A Jehovah Witness might stand out there, but they wouldn't tell them that. And there may be some unsaved people preaching the street, but they preach revolution and social reform. They wouldn't preach what we preach. You ever do something just a Christian would do? How many things you done this week? All right, last. If it's nighttime, the sun is about to appear. And you know, that doesn't shock some of God's people. doesn't wake them up and they think, well, it's going to just be like other night. I don't care if the Lord's coming back. I'm just going to do business as usual. They say, Mrs. Paul Revere said to her husband on the night of the ride, I don't care who you say is coming. It's my night to use the horse. <laughs> <laughs> so you know about God's people that's the, you know that's what it is with God's people some of them you know I don't care who you say is coming I'm going to do this and that you know well now the Lord's coming and the darker it gets the earlier it's getting toward dawn I know you get weary and well doing although Paul told you not to I get weary myself and well doing though Paul told us not to but there's one thing about that night time that goes on and on and on and as sure as you live and breathe the sun's coming up one of these days is coming I hope it's right now. I hope it's for lunch. I have no need of lunch. I hope it's for to go back to the house. I have no need of my house. As far as I'm concerned, the Lord can come right this second, and as far as I'm concerned, that'd just be the best possible thing that ever could happen. 
And I just, when I, when I get up there, I'm gonna, the only thing I'm going to reprove him for <laughs> is not coming sooner. You know, Peter took the Lord aside and began to rebuke him. You remember that? How many of you remember that? Let me see your hands. What the rest of you read anyway. And he took him aside and began to rebuke him and said, Far be it from thee, Lord, you know, this thing shall not be to thee, so forth. I might always kind of thought in my mind, when I get through the judgment seat of Christ and see everything burn up in a bonfire and get my new clothes and get settled, see, for I'm sure of myself, <laughs> then I'm going to say, Lord, don't you think it'd been better if you made it back there, you know, and then, he'll, of course, he'll give me the answer. When I, when I was traveling with my family in the days of evangelist for about, oh, 12, 13 years, I used to take my children with me in the summertime, and back those days, they're very young. Some of them weren't even born. And uh, I'm... <laughs> I put uh, I put David down here in the front row, and he was about oh about four or five years old. I sit with him when it came time to go up to preach, and just me and the kids together. And, and when I get up sometime, he starts to follow me up the platform, you know. I tell him to go back, and he's cry about it, you know. And I finally figured a way to do it, and I carry two Bibles with me, see, and I leave the Bible that's going to preach on up there in the pulpit, and, and keep the one full of notes with me in the seat. And then when it came time to preach, I take that Bible and lay it right down the seat. And I'd say, now, boy, I said, watch that for me, and I'll come back and get it. I just pleased him as he just pleased punch for that, because he knew I wouldn't uh, forget that Bible. Now, of course, I've been known to forget him under stress and strain, but, <laughs> you know, when the, when the dust cleared, then everything else had to get aside until I got that Bible. That hurricane started through a couple nights back, you know. We were picking up tape recorders and things, getting ready to move out in case it came through, which it didn't come through. The only thing that bothered me the most is I couldn't find my Bibles, two of them. I finally found them under a rug in the back of the car, you know. You know, we operate a little different than some of you normal folks do at <laughs> work. And, uh, you know, I, I came over to this church at 10 o'clock. I'm that wind again, had a little lights near going through this place. It bothers me not to have that book. If a hurricane came through, I'd want to have that, my children first and that book next. And I said to the boy, I said, watch the book for me till I come back. I'm coming back for my word. And the Lord's coming back for his word. And the Lord left us a book, see, and put it down here and said, here, watch this thing for me a minute. I'm going to leave, and I'm going to come back and get it. And if you're there by that word, he won't miss you. He won't miss you. Horatius Bonar, the old English preacher, used to go to bed at night. When he go to bed at night, he'd turn off the lights, lift up the shade, and open his window halfway, top and bottom. He'd look out there across those moonlit fields and those, that star-drenched landscape. He'd look out across there in that old blue-green light, and he'd say, maybe it'll be tonight. Maybe it'll be tonight. And he'd lie down and go to sleep. In the morning, he'd get up, stretch, and go over there and open that window up all the way and look out across the sunlit fields, and he'd say, maybe it'll be today. Maybe it'll be today. And Horatius Bonar has been dead now for more than 60 years. And the Lord never came in his lifetime, but he was a beautiful example. I mean, be there all for, therefore also ready for such an hour as you think not the Son of Man coming. When you got up this morning, did you open the window and say, maybe it'll be today, maybe it'll be today. When you go to bed at night and get ready to open the windows or shut the windows or turn the air conditioning, you're going to say, maybe it'll be tonight, maybe it'll be tonight. Down in Nicaragua, they had a revolt down there several years back, oh, it's been 30, 40 years now, and there's a preacher in the ministry, his name was Barry Hill, and Barry Hill at that time was an unsaved Marine, and he was down there in Nicaragua in a certain town, and they were sent down there to put down a rebel named Sandino, and the American troops, the Marines were in there with orders not to get in a fight if they could avoid it, and in a certain town, I forget the name of it, the Marines were all called in one company and put in barracks, and they were told this. They said, San Nino is attacking and coming across such and such place and may attack this town. He has a few artillery pieces. And they said, we don't want the United States government to get involved, at least not now. And if he attacks this town, then you're going to have to fight. And if he attacks this town, the government will be involved. But if he doesn't, you've got to get out. And the Marines want to know how do we get out. And they told him this. They said they're going to be four or five, two and a half ton trucks pull up in the alley behind this barracks sometime tonight. And they said, if they get here before San Dino gets here, you'll hear a trumpet out there in the alleyway, and you pile out getting those trucks and head out the back end of town, 
but you be in full battle gear ready to fight in case they don't come. So the night wore on about 9 o'clock at night. There were 200 Marines in that barracks, and they were sitting there full field packed, rifles loaded, extra bandoliers ammunition, and sitting there in the bunk. And about 10 o'clock at night, they begin to hear their artillery. It's got just one or two obsolete 75 millimeter cannon going off. And about 12 o'clock at night, they heard the small arms fire. And their orders were, stay in there. Do you hear that bugle in the back alley? And don't go. Do you hear that bugle? Do you hear that bugle? You go. And long about 1.30 in the morning, they could see the flashes of the artillery pieces out there in the hills. And the small arms fire getting louder and louder. And the sweat began to run off their faces. And a couple of those fellas, two of them, got up and said, well, what's the blankety blank blank? I know you stay in this blankety blank place waiting to die. The so and so with us, you know. And they got up and went on out there and had them a time. They're going to have one matter before they got shot. And they went on out there and they hadn't been going that barracks. Barry Hill said they hadn't been going that barracks. Forty-five minutes. That old bugle sounded off now. Five those two and a half ton trucks came in there, pulled up alongside there. Those old boys galloped and started out of those barracks, jumped in the back of those trucks, <laughs> got out of there and got out of the way. And the next night, the Marines came back into that town and recaptured that town from San Dino, who had attacked it. And they found those two GIs. And both of them were dead. And one of them was mutilated in the way you could describe. And one of them had his tongue cut out. They're both dead. And the Bible says, Watch, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man will come in a day when he's not aware and cut him asunder and appoint his portion for the unbelievers. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch, watch, watch. And God's people ought to be fully armed and ready for combat and waiting for the trumpet. Waiting for the trumpet. All right, let's stand for prayer. Now, I'm not going to give an invitation this morning. Let's bow our heads and be dismissed in prayer. Don't forget to be back tonight now in the evening service at 7 o'clock. Be preaching tonight at 7 o'clock on So You Want to Be a Man. Father, bless the message this morning, and I pray if there's any unsaved person, either in this building or out across the radio wave, that's unsaved, they'll be converted and trust your Son as a Savior. Lord, help us not be weary in well-doing. Help us to continue, Father, patience, sowing the seed, waiting on thee. Lord, we pray as John the Apostle, even so come, Lord Jesus. And Father, I pray if there's any way you can wind up this mess today, you'll do it. If there's any way it can be done now, Lord, do it now. Don't let us wait. If there's any way, Father, in your schedule that you can break it up now, Lord, break it up now. And, Father, we're ready to go. Our hearts are right with thee as they can get. Lord, we pray that you come and take us home, be with thee in the sky very soon. Preferably today, Lord. Father, I don't have any...